turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to pick it up at verse 18. And uh, you, if you've been here a while, you know we're pretty much going through this thing verse for verse. And that might change later on, but I would say <laughs> don't count on it, okay? Uh, just the way I preach, this is the way I preach, and I can't do anything about it. I've tried, and uh, i failed. So I'm going to do it the way I do it. Revelation 2, verse 18 through 19 is where we start. And uh, what I want to do is give you some uh, a, a background on this thing so that you understand that what we're talking about here does apply today. And I'll give you all the lessons of application at the very end. And you can write them down or you can get the CD or you can pull it up off the web in a few days. Whatever you want to do. But I really hope and pray that you will pay sincere attention to this particular message. As I really do for all. But this one is very key. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 18 and 19, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like brass. So let's begin first of all with that. Jesus has revealed himself in his names throughout this book so far. With each church, it's been a different kind of a name. And most of those names have been somewhat uh, comforting and uh, uh, peace giving. In this particular case, he's going back to the proof and to the expression of his deity. He is now saying to the church at Thyatira that he is divine, that he is the Son of God. And he's lining this out for us because he's about to say some things that though on one piece are good, the other part is not so good at all. And he's establishing in this phrase the Son of God his right as the sovereign of the universe to speak to the church as he chooses, to speak to the church what he sees. And we read in this passage, it says, who has eyes of fire and feet as burnished bronze or brass. What that means is, and we talked about it several weeks ago, that with these eyes of fire, he's able to look inside the heart and the mind of every person in the church, and he looks into a church collectively to see what's happening so he might speak to that very thing. So this morning as you listen, I want you to be aware that you are going to be challenged on two levels. You're going to be challenged first as an individual, that Jesus Christ by his spirit with his powerful eyes will be able to look right into your heart and into your mind. He sees it now. And you're probably thinking, I hope I can lock this up so he can't see it. He can see it, okay? He also will look at the church collectively. And when he speaks these messages, he speaks both collectively and individualistically. So we need to be ready to hear both. In Psalm 139, verse 1, David writes to us, you can read it up here, and the, whoop, it isn't there yet, but there it goes. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. He goes on to talk about, there's no place that God cannot find David. There's no word in his mouth that God doesn't know it before he speaks it. There's no thought in his mind that he doesn't think it before God already knows it. There's no place that he can sit down or stand up. He can't hide from God in Sheol. He can't go anywhere that God is not. And that's an amazing knowledge that even when you're thinking a sinful thought, God knows that. And he knows you're going to think that thought before you think it. Now that's pretty intimate knowledge, amen? I want you to know that God knows you and me just that way. He knows this church as a collective body because he sees the church as his body, the body of Jesus Christ. That's who we are on the earth today. So now he's speaking to his collective body and to the individuals therein as the Son of God, as the one with the authority, not only to see, but the authority to speak. So that's what we start with. And then we go on and we read here, he says, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. This is a good report. He's saying, look, I've looked at you. I've seen what you've done since you've come into my kingdom. I see how you have lived. I've seen the works that you do. And remember a few weeks ago we talked about from Ephesians 2.10 that there are works created for us beforehand, before we were saved, that we should walk in them. That's God's intention. He's created these very things for you and for me individually and as a church corporately to walk, 
to do those things which he created beforehand that we should have purpose, that we should have direction, that we should accomplish things in the kingdom of God. Faith is not just sitting. Faith is action. Amen? Amen. And then action is not necessarily faith, but both mixed together brings power in the life of the church and in the life of the believer. Now, then he goes on in verse 20. Look at what he says. He says, nevertheless, whoo, whenever you see a nevertheless, buckle up. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that Jezebel, that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So now we're going to look that there is a problem here at the church of Thyatira. They've got a tremendous history. And I believe probably to the unknowing and the unsuspecting, had they walked into the church of Thyatira 2,000 some odd years ago, they would have thought, wow, this is a smoking church. This has really got it. They're together. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're doing this. They're doing that. And that'd all be true. But he was also saying, you've got a problem inside. There's an internal issue, and he says, you allow. Look at that. Take a look at that again. He says, you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Everybody say, allow. allow. Say it again. Allow. When you look at this, he's, it's not that it's there, and that's bad enough, but he's saying, you allow this. So what's going on is that the church is being corrupted by false teaching, in false actions, and he's saying, you're allowing it. You're not doing anything about it. And it's the duty of the church as a whole, collectively, and it is also the duty of the pastors and the leadership of every local church to protect and defend the Word of God, the Orthodox faith. Amen? Amen. And if you don't want that, you don't belong in this building, because that's what we teach. It's all we teach. And I gave a listing last week of about the five or so things the week before of what true Christian orthodoxy is. And it's not what a lot of people think. It's not the liturgical approach. It's the basic foundations of the Christian faith. And so what we see here is they've allowed something to take place that should never have been allowed. And no one, apparently including the messenger of the church, had been unwilling to deal with. That's a very frightening thing. When you think that you would be in a church where something's loose in it and no one will deal with it. So let me tell you what's going on here. The first thing you look at in Thyatira, to give you the setting, is that Thyatira was a commercial uh, city. And it was very wealthy, as many of those cities in that region were. But it was completely and totally ensconced in uh, paganism. They had fortune tellers on every street. And when Shirley and I lived in Guiyang, China, we would walk down certain streets and every other person was a fortune teller. And, and you'd see people sitting there, you know, I wonder which fortune teller I'm going to go to. I'll go to this one or this one or this one. And then they go to a fortune teller over here to tell them which fortune teller they should go to. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. And they believed this stuff to the bone. That's what it was. And so what's happening now is Thyatira is completely swamped in pagan religion. Now that's bad enough. But the problem with it was, is they were a wealthy city, and they had work unions. We call them unions today. Then they were called guilds. They had to be a part of a union in order to work. Doesn't sound so bad to some people. If you're neither here nor there on unions, it makes no difference for this message. But the reality is, they couldn't get a job if they couldn't join a union. And the Christians often did not join unions because in that city in particular, to be a part of a union, you had to participate in certain things. And the beginning of each union meeting was an oblation or drink offering held up in a cup to the pagan god. They met in the pagan temples because they were the biggest place to gather. They went there and they toasted the pagan idol and they all had a big drink. Well, then after that, they had a great big feast. And they would eat meat sacrificed to idols in honor of the idol. That's why they were doing that. And they'd get drunk. And I mean drunk like drunk. And then they would have orgies. And every kind of sexual immorality that you can name would take place in that area. All of them together. It wasn't even like we went off in a little vestibule. It was everybody doing everything that you could think of or dream of. Which we shouldn't. But that's what was going on. 
And so it was a difficult time because the Christians, the true Christians, would not participate in that. Therefore, they would be put out of business or they wouldn't have work. They couldn't buy food, clothing, or shelter. They were in a great struggle for their faith and for their livelihood because of this, uh, this amalgamation of economy with culture and with religion. And so they were struggling with that whole thing. There was tremendous pressure. And in the process of this whole thing, if they didn't participate, they didn't eat. And out of this mess steps Jezebel. Now, we don't really know who she is, but we know she is a real woman and she really existed. In fact, I asked in the first service, because nobody likes Jezebel, says, has anybody here ever known a daughter or a woman named Jezebel? If you did, raise your hand. You know what? I've never had anybody raise their hand, and today it happened. And I thought, boy, what, what person would have named their child Jezebel? But somebody did. I don't know how that turned out, but be that as it may. Jezebel in the Old Testament was married to King Ahab, and she was a horrible person. She was the one who tried to kill Elijah. She's the one who killed a man for his, his vineyard to give it to Ahab. The list goes on. She is known among scholars as the most evil woman in all of Old Testament history. That ain't no nice lady, amen? She was a murderer, a liar, a cheat, a thief. She was all of that stuff rolled into one, and then also an idolater. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus sees a woman like this inside, inside the church. He says, you've got a Jezebel in there, and if you don't know it, I'll tell you. And if you do know it, you're allowing it, and I'm real unhappy about that. So what this message is about is that we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ and nothing else. He is everything that we need. There'll never be anything more than we need than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus is everything to me. That's who he is. So Jezebel, she comes out and it says, he says, who calls herself a prophetess. Now that's an interesting thing. She's self-proclaimed as a prophetess. That means that she's claiming divine authority. And she's saying that she is superior to the messenger of the church. Now, I have to tell you, I don't know why the messenger of the church didn't say anything, but he didn't. I don't know what he was afraid of, but he needed to speak the truth, and he was unwilling to do that. I pray that I never be like that. And I'll tell you, there are times when you do get afraid, but then you've got to press forward. And so she's there, and she's claiming herself to be superior to the leadership of the church. That's a dangerous thing. Folks, if you hear that in this congregation, you need to do an about face and run. Because the church is the church. God has ordained this church as the body of Christ. God has ordained the leadership, like me or not, like Pastor Ben or not, like the leadership of the church when the governing board and so on. He's ordained that that be the case. Amen. And these men including Pastor Ben and myself, are given the charge and the responsibility to guide and provide for the congregation. It's our duty, and if we fail in it, we have to answer for that. And that's why I'll give you a message like this, because I'd rather you be mad at me than he be mad at me. Amen? Amen? So that's where I'm coming from on this thing. So Jezebel has proclaimed herself to be a prophetess. She has a superior attitude, says she has a superior way. And then beyond that, she taught them that it was okay, that it was all right. They've got Jesus here. Now go worship there too and practice the practices of these pagan religions. Go get drunk, have a feast in the name of a demon, and then go on and have sex with everybody and anything that you can find. Now that doesn't belong in the church. You see, she was working something there to build something for herself. And that's why churches are careful about who they ordain and who they license. Because you've got to find someone who is consonant with the Word of God. Period. Now, I don't know everything. I know that. And I know that there's some things that I don't understand. But what I do understand, I will teach you. And this much I understand. This is the Word of God. Amen. And nothing beats the Word of God. Don't forget that this word of God is Jesus' words to you and me. Yes, it was the Holy Spirit that led men of old who were righteous and holy to write the word of God. But from Genesis to Revelation, it is the word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus was involved in its production. And him, plus his word, 
plus the Holy Spirit is all that you need. Amen? Amen. If you believe that, you're in the right church. If you don't, you need to think it through and maybe make a new decision. So anyway, what happened was, he says, you've allowed this. You've permitted this woman to continue with this teaching. You've allowed her to bring in idolatry and to seduce you into that idolatry and to seduce you into sensual <clears throat> behavior. Not sinful, yes, sinful, but sensual. And you've allowed her to seduce you into immorality. Now, remember... About three, maybe four weeks ago, I was talking about uh, the church at, uh, at, at uh, where was it? Uh, da, 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 da. We, but they, they were dealing with the Nicolaitan heresy. And, and what was going on, it was Pergamos. And they were dealing with this heresy and this Nicolaitan thing. And we talked about what was the foundation of that. And I gave you a whole list of things that were very clear about the Nicolaitan heresy and how it worked and how it got into the church and how people of influence would lead people who were not aware of what was going on, draw them into that very thing. And then they would be brought into uh, error through that kind of work. And what they did was they used sensuality to reach the people. And remember I explained, and I'm going to explain it again lest you forget, because I don't want you to ever forget this lesson. That when God speaks to you in the spirit, it is not emotional. Now, when he speaks to you in the spirit, you may be overcome. And you may hit the dirt. You may go, oh, man, God is here. And you may have an emotional response. But it starts in the spirit and moves to the soul, which contains the emotions. And you may respond to that. But a lot of the false teachers over all of time and even to this day use sensuality to bring people into the cult. Now when I say sensuality, I don't mean sexuality necessarily. Sensuality refers to the five senses of mankind. Sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. All of those. And so these groups will bring you in and give you an experience. And they'll guarantee you, you'll have an experience. And I'll guarantee you, you will. They'll see to it that you have an experience in the sensual realm, in the senses. And then when that happens, they'll build on that and build on that till emotions break forth or whatever it is that they're looking for. And then they will tell you that's of God. Yep. It's going backwards. God does not come in the back door. He never comes in the back door. He's an honest God. He's a loving God. He's a faithful God. He will come to you in the spirit. For God is spirit. And you may have an amazing response emotionally. But it will begin and it will end in the realm of the spirit. That's important. Don't let anybody fool you, church, to think that because you went through this experience that you've had an encounter with God. The 70s were filled with things like that. Come, have an experience, and we'll show you God. What they showed them was flesh. What they showed them was an emotional catharsis that often brought them into deeper and deeper traps. I can't tell you how many times in my early ministry that I had to bring people through deliverance from those kinds of movements. So that's what's going on with this Jezebel. And what's also taking place, you'll find, let's skip down in Revelation 2 to verse 24. We're going to get the rest of it, but look at this. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. That's very interesting, the depths of Satan. What is that? The depth of Satan goes back to the age-old lie. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Eve is now being tempted. Not Adam. Eve. She's the one who begins in deception. And the devil brings what is called the satanic if. And he's saying, you know, if, if this be true, did God really say that you couldn't eat of that tree? Listen to what it goes. Here's the story. Then the serpent said to the woman, you won't die. God's lying to you. Can God tell a lie? No. Never. God is lying to you. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's the lie. 
of many of the mystery religions. It's the lie of many of the cults that are even moving about in our world today. That if you'll do these things, you will be like God. The lie is that God is hiding something from you. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I've heard it. I've been invited to different meetings and things and discovered that they were cults. And they all had a general theme that Jesus was God, but there's a lot more that he can't give you. And that God himself has hidden something from you. God's cheating you. That's what they tell you. And people believe it. And then they have a sensual a senses experience, and they believe that it has been confirmed. Absolutely a lie. It's the same old lie that God is cheating you out of the really good stuff because, of course, he doesn't want you to be like him because he might not be able to handle you. That's what they teach. It's sad, isn't it? It's tragic. But that's what goes on, and it goes on in the churches today. You heard me a few weeks ago talking about the fact that we have things on the TV and on the radio and in these, all these books and stuff, and you have to be really careful when you read it because they start with a little piece of truth. Remember I talked about that? And they have just a little piece of truth, but then they're just off a little bit. And I gave you the example that, that uh, Tony shared with me. I asked him, I said, Tony, if you started off from a plane from Anchorage and you were heading to Hawaii and you were one degree off, would you get to Hawaii? And he knew the, the algorithm. He says, no, you'd be 80 miles off. That's a long way off. And you're not going to get where you're going. And so when we get one degree off, just one degree, and you travel that degree for a few years in your faith, you will find yourself completely apart from the true Christian faith. And the true Christian faith is found in Bible churches, in biblical teaching, biblically teaching churches. That's where it's found. Not just Bible church. It may be an Assembly of God church. It may be a Baptist church. It may be a lot of places. But is the word there? And is there a reliance upon the word of God? So Jesus is pretty uptight about this kind of thing. He shows it there with Jezebel, but he's also warning us today. Be careful of the sensual experiences of those who claim superiority. Who say, come and you'll experience God. Come and we'll show you the authentic faith. It's authentic right here. Believe me, I work with people all week long. You are authentic. <laughs> All God's children are authentic. Believe me. It's amazing. I have to rely on prayer a lot and the word as I work with all of you, and I love all of you. And that's why I speak a message like I speak today. I don't want you pulled off and sucked off into stuff that's not biblical. I don't want you pulled off into things that guarantee this and guarantee that. Nobody can guarantee that you're going to have a kapow experience with God. That happens when God shows up. And God shows up when God chooses to show up, not before. Amen? Amen. So I want you to be careful. Do I sound intense today? Thank you. Okay. I'm not yelling or screaming. Not yet. Okay. But I want you to know these things because it's important. And you see, these groups will always promise you more than the church can give you. They'll always say, well, we're not quite orthodox, but, but we can give you more. We can set you free from the bondage of the church. We are the body of Christ. Say it with me. We are the body of Christ. We have tremendous value. We have tremendous power. We have tremendous authority just in the name of Jesus Christ. Now let's move on down here as it goes along. What's Jesus' response? Look at this now. We'll go back up to verse 21 and 23 where we left off because we had to look at verse 24. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. Now he's speaking about spiritual death there. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now this is an amazing statement. What's happening here, Jesus is telling us that he gave this woman time to repent of her false teaching. He's actually giving the church time to repent of allowing false teaching. And I know that sometimes I'm a little unpopular, make some people angry. I can't make apology for that. I can only teach you what I know the word says. And it's brought a lot of heat to me on occasion, but that's okay. 
Because it isn't about me. It's about the message and it's about you. It's about what God longs to give you in your lives. And you see, God always gives time. God always gives an opportunity to repent. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is, lo- is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus has apparently, before we hear this message, spoken to this woman in some way, maybe through the messenger of the church that said, you need to repent. She was unrelenting and unrepenting. And because of that, he says, I have nothing left that I can do. I've gone as far as I will go with this woman because she is seducing the body of Christ. And so he's going to bring judgment upon her. He's going to throw her into a sickbed. He's going to throw her and them into tribulation. You see, refusal to repent only has one answer, judgment. That's all that is there. Saints don't believe that that was just for that day. Judgment can fall upon the people of God if they continue to live unrepentantly. When you have sin, you need to confess it and repent of it. And I want you to know that repentance is not just turning from the sin to something else. I've seen people do that. Well, I, I, I know I've been doing this wrong, so I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn my life around and go in another direction. True repentance is turning from your sin and turning to Jesus Christ. That is repentance. Anything else is just you doing it your own way again in another way. Turn from sin, turn from error, turn from heresy, turn from false doctrine, and turn to Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. And she was unwilling to do that, whoever she was. We don't know her real name, but she was in a world of hurt and was unwilling to repent. I suspect it's because she had a following. I suspect it's because her pride was saying, I can beat this, I can, I can do this. Doesn't turn out so well. Our pride never turns out well. And so Jesus said, these are the things that I will do. So number one, he gives always an opportunity to repent. Number two, if you refuse repentance, then you are accepting his judgment and the reprisals for the things you have done. Now notice what he says here too. I will cast her into a sickbed, those who commit adultery with her to great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. That means her followers. And all the churches shall know that I am the Lord. That searches the hearts and the minds. Look at this. He's not just punishing Jezebel. But those people who have followed her are subject to the same judgment. You see, the seducer is judged. But so are those who have been seduced. There is a judgment for that. And we like to blame somebody else. Adam wanted to blame Eve, but he was accountable, he was responsible, and he was culpable. All of it was his to do. And when he tried to deny it, the Lord had to deal with it. I've often wondered what would have happened if Adam would have just confessed as the Lord, God, I really messed up here. Could we start this thing over? I don't know what that might have been. I only know what is, and that's all I can tell you. But this much I can say. You can't say, well, that person seduced me into this, therefore they're responsible. No, you are responsible, you are culpable, you are accountable, and so am I. So when we see sin, when we see error, when we see false teaching, when we see superiority and lawlessness, all of that we need to repent of. And we need to say an absolute N-O to that. And we need to say at that moment, you don't need to think about it. You don't need to pray about it. And if you're concerned about it and you don't know, go to the leadership of your church. Go to them and say, do you know about this? Did you understand this? What do you think of that? Let them tell you. That's what the pastors and the leaders of the churches are for. They're there, as it were, kind of to keep a gate, to keep watch at the door, and to understand that someone might claim that this is Christian, but you can't just look at what they say and what they teach. You must also look at the spirit of that person. What's underneath it? What underlies that? Is it the spirit of Christ, or is it another spirit foreign to God himself. You must always be on your guard. Not paranoid, but on your guard. 
And the best thing that you can do is to stay in the word. If you know the real, you'll recognize the counterfeit. Amen? Amen. It's there. I tell you, I have been in those places. I've walked into where there were cults way back in the 70s and even in the last few years of my life. And I can feel it. I just know it. And I don't know what's wrong, but Shirley and I will talk and say, well, there's something wrong there. Can't quite figure it out just yet, but let's wait and see. And every time, every time, it's Jesus plus something else. It's Jesus plus this or that. It's, it's the church, but there's more than just what the church offers you. When you hear that, saints, run the other way. Run the other way. Is the church perfect? Everybody says no. no. But the church is the ordained body that God has left on the earth. And we need to stay with one another. And if we see things that are out of order or even suspect they're out of order, someone needs to come to the pastor and say, hey, I think there's a goofball thing here. Something's out of order. Pastor, I don't know what it is, but can we find out? Go to the leadership and say, what is this stuff? Very important for you to do that because you do not want to be seduced. Because once you have been seduced, if you don't recognize it and you can't repent of it, the only thing is reprisal and judgment. And God will do that. And you say to me, no, he doesn't do that kind of thing today. Oh, yes, he does. I've told you stories before. I'll tell you some now, just really briefly. When we were in Tanzania, Tukiko Omosa was our administrator and my interpreter. Tremendously godly man. Filled with the Holy Spirit, just an awesome man. Preached all on his own without me around at all. But he would tell us these stories when he would go out. He's an evangelist in his own right. And they would go and they'd work in villages to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would encounter a shaman, a witch doctor, whatever you want to call them. And the shaman would resist them and not allow them to bring in the gospel. And he'd do all this and go against the gospel. Speak to all the people and tell them to avoid the preachers and the teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tukiko and his team would pray about these men and sometimes women and say, Lord, you know, bring them to repentance, bring them to repentance. And he said, but then the Lord would speak to us and say, well, they're not going to repent, so then I'm going to bring judgment. And he would tell story after story in village after village where the shamans resisted the gospel of Christ. Some did get saved, but many just mysteriously died. <coughs> they weren't sick. Nobody knew anything was wrong with them, but they died. And then the gospel went forward. So saints, don't think, don't think that you can get away with it. Whatever it is in your life, repent of it so that God can preserve you and keep you in his perfect will. Now the encouragement is simply this. Look at verse 24 through 29. I don't want to keep you here all night, so I'll, I'll close quickly. But now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have the doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he goes on and he says, I will give you the power and the authority to rule and to reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium. That's what he promises. But he says, hold fast. Don't yield. There is a beauty and a simplicity in the person of Jesus Christ. And anything more than that is walking in danger. He's saying, hold fast to my son. Hold fast to my word. Hold fast to my promises and watch what I will do. Now, as we close this, I want to bring you these lessons. And I really will close here. First of all, we must understand that the modern church today is as subject to these problems, if not more so, than the early church. We have radio, we have internet, we have TV, we have books. There's so much stuff out there that frankly is not biblical. I'm being nice with my terms. It's not good stuff. And it belongs in the ash can somewhere. That's where it belongs because it's leading people astray. I meet people all the time that are reading every book you can think of but the Bible. Read the Bible, get to know Jesus. And it will be astounding. Now, there are some good books you should be able to read. I'm not saying you can't. But you need to be discerning. You need to understand what it is that you're looking at. He says, hold fast what you have. Because the modern church has the same problem today that the church of the early church of the first century had. It's still here. It still comes. It gets into churches. It gets into this church. You have to be careful. You have to use wisdom. And you have to have courage to say no. Now here's the thing that I want you to know. Here's the lessons. Number one, resist cultural drift. 
Remember we talked about Thyatira and the trade unions and the pagan worship. Resist that. They're always, the world is always wanting us to compromise. Amen? That's what they want. That's how they live. If they can compromise the Christian, then they have won a battle. So we cannot be rude, we cannot be crude, cannot be socially unacceptable, but we can be strong. And we can hold fast to the true faith and to the principles that we have there and the lifestyles that we should live. And be unafraid. People have told me before, I've heard it said even in this church, when we were talking about the business thing, and this actually has happened to me more than once. Well, you, you're not a businessman. You don't understand what we go through. I've had 52 different kinds of jobs in my lifetime, literally, counted it up. And I've owned two businesses of my own over the years. My businesses flourished so much that I almost didn't go to seminary. Because, I, hey, I can make a lot of money just sitting down here. I can travel to Hawaii and go around the world, do whatever I want. Simple janitorial type ministry. But it exploded. And everybody said, well, you can't do it the way you're going to do it. I said, I will only do it this way because it's God's way. And he always blessed it. That first customer or two were pretty hard to get. But once I got it, the reputation began to grow. So don't tell me that you can't do this in the world. You can. Yeah, you may pay a price. Too bad. <laughs> we are obligated to live the way God causes us to live. And he's promised us if we will do what he says to do, he will give us not only success, he will give us good success. But sometimes it takes a little bit of time. You kind of got to prime the pump, keep going. All of a sudden the water starts to come, a little squirt here, a little squirt there, and all of a sudden it's just flowing. But you got to do it God's way. Do not give in to cultural pressure, political correctness, or cultural drift. Don't go there. If you go there, your children will go there. They're liable to go there anyway, but hopefully you will be the one who sets the standard in the home and that somewhere in the future they will return to that standard. Amen? Amen. Number one lesson. Number two lesson. Beware of claims of superiority, of experience, or of authenticity. I'm telling you, saints, this is an authentic church as is any other church. Amen? Amen. We may not agree on some points of doctrine. There may be some issues here and issues there, but they are and we are the body of Jesus Christ. And if anyone rises up and says, well, we can show you this. We know the church just doesn't do what you need. We can do it. You better run. You better run quick to who God is because those people will lead you off and away from the body of Christ. They'll lead you to themselves. It's very clear in Scripture that that's exactly what they do. And that's what you want to avoid. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, verse 7. I really am almost through. But this is a big message. It's an important message, and I want you to hear it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 7, part B. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. If you add anything, especially in the sensual realm, to the gospel of Christ, you are in error. I'll put it to you straight. Anything. It may look good, but it probably doesn't smell good. And you may think that it'll do you good, but in the long haul, it doesn't do any good at all. So beware of the claims of superiority. And then be aware, saints, that there's a tremendous attraction to anything that is new and different, especially in the church. You know the old thing, give me the old time religion? That's kind of me. Why? Because the old-time religion is based on the Word of God. It's based on the person of Jesus Christ. Saved by faith alone. Redeemed by faith alone. Transformed by faith alone with the working of the Holy Spirit within me. All I need is Jesus Christ, His Word, and His Spirit, and I'm on my way. That's all I need. Of course, I need the body of Christ. But with that, we've got all that we could possibly need for any kind of healing in our lives. So be careful of anything that's new and different. Turn with me to Acts chapter uh, 20, verse 30. Acts 20, verse 30. I keep telling you I'm almost done, and I'm really telling you that I really am. But I want you to know, i got to get all this said today. Thank you, Ron. It is, it is okay, I guess. And from among yourselves, now listen to this, saints, listen to this very carefully. And from among yourselves, men will rise up and our women, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. You ever notice that? 
they don't really draw you to Jesus. They'll draw you to an experience. And they will draw you to allegiance to themselves. That's not a good thing. You see, I don't want you to be allegiant to me. I have never wanted that. And I think any of the men that work with me will tell you that. They know that of me. I want you to fall in love with Jesus Christ. That's my one goal of my whole life is to preach his gospel that people would be saved from their sin, kept safe from error, and fall more and more in love with Jesus their Savior. That's all I'm about. It's all I'm about. Whatever else goes on, I don't know. But that's all I'm about. I don't want your allegiance to me. I'm thankful for your love, and I'm thankful for our relationship, but I don't want you to be tied to me before you're tied to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Lots of people try to get people committed to them, and it's a religious movement, or it's a cult movement, or whatever it may be. I tell you, I will always and only ever teach you the Word of God, and I will always, only, and ever point you to Jesus Christ. That's my pledge to you because I love you and because I do not want to get in trouble with God. <laughs> I don't want him to be unhappy with me. So watch out for the appeal of the new, for the appeal of the different. Well, you know, we're not orthodox. It, it, it's okay. No, it isn't okay. Orthodox faith is what keeps us sound and solid in the word. Others will teach you heterodoxy. That means to add to orthodoxy. We must be very careful regarding that. And then it says in this passage, lesson four, repent. If you find yourself in that kind of thing, in error or in any kind of sin, you need to repent because if you don't, tribulation's coming. It's a guarantee. You might go along in a season for a while and you get all blessed, but somewhere along the way, the bottom of that barrel will fall out and you'll be in a free fall. Only God can save you from that. So if you find yourselves in any of those kinds of movements or any kinds of sins that draw you away from Jesus Christ and his word, and his word, you need to repent. And then you cannot blame others. This is the next part of the lesson. Just recapping it all for you. You cannot blame others. You, if you have been seduced, will have the same judgment and the same penalty as the one who seduced you. Amen? You need to know that, saints. It's one of the toughest messages I've ever given you, but I say it because I love you. If you've been seduced, you need to get unseduced. You need to repent and get back to the Word and stay strong in the Scripture and follow Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It is your only hope and it is your only answer. And then pastors... I say it to pastors because we're going to go out on the radio. Pastors and leaders of churches, you need to stand against false doctrine. You and we and I and the pastors and the leadership of this church need to stand against error. Amen. And we need to teach it openly and clearly that people will know exactly what we're saying. Amen. And I'm sure that that's happened today. It tells us that we must be a people who are committed to that. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, last one that I'll refer to. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll get there. For I am jealous for you. And that's what I would say to you as your pastor, one of your pastors. I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. But I fear, listen to me, but I fear, and these are Paul's words, but they're my words too, that somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. It's simplicity. Knowing Jesus Christ, that is all that we have to know. That's the lesson today. And I urge you to be faithful. I urge you to have your spiritual ears open and clean so that you can tell and discern, is this something that I should be doing or something I should not be doing? And if it's something I shouldn't be doing and I'm here, I need to get myself up and leave. That's the reality. 
I have done it more than once in my lifetime as a Christian. Even as a young man, I had spiritual discernment. As a young believer, I could sniff it out. I couldn't always tell you what it is. Surely could tell you right away. But I could sniff it out and I'd say, something stinks in here. This doesn't pass the sniff test. Let's leave. And then we'd drive home and she said, well, here's what it was. Said, well, how did you know that? She said, I could smell it too. It's amazing. Be careful, saints. I know this is an intense message, but it's in the Word. It's one of the churches in the Revelation. So I'm obligated to tell you, be careful. Guard your theology. Guard your practices. Guard your mind. And above all, guard your heart. Because these are the things that develop in you and in me true faith, living faith in Jesus Christ. You don't need anything more than Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the saints. I know this has been one of those wild and intense messages, but Lord, it needed to be said. I pray for deliverance from any and all who get themselves involved in any and all things that are not pointing squarely at the word and at Jesus Christ. We'll come against anything, Lord, that would bring us into sensuality and immorality, separating us from the true gospel and the true simplicity of that gospel, who is Jesus saves. He saves. And if he saves, he can keep. And if he can keep, he alone can deliver us. Deliver us into your kingdom, Father. To your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.